Well, thank you, Richard, very much for very kind words. And thank you for the welcome from Horsham Interfaith, from St. Mary's Church, and from the council here. And you've really taken what I was going to say first, Tim, was a thank you to Richard and to all of you for the, the arrangement. I mean, I, I was one, thinking this morning, perhaps what I was going to talk about is too optimistic. Is one reads the news and the tragic, tragic events in Egypt and in Syria. But I was reminded of a remark of Naomi Garbo, the abstract artist. And at the, early in the Second World War, he was continuing with his abstract art. And somebody asked him why he was doing it, what was the point as the world was falling to pieces. And he said, I'm going on with it because I want to keep alive the dream of a world that we have left behind. And maybe we're not in that position, but what I hope to do is by looking back to renew something of the vision which has inspired the Interfaith family. And it's wonderful to see so many members of that family here, some we already know, others I look forward to getting, getting to know. And so um, I use the title Widening Vision really in two senses. But first of all, the question which is adapted from Cantwell Smith, how wide is our vision? When those of us who are Christian pray, give us this day our daily bread, who are the us we are thinking of? Are we thinking, do they include the Syrian refugee child or those who live on the streets of Calcutta. So, it's also, as I say, about recognizing the wideness of God's love. Um, and you know me, but what God's love is for all people, whatever their faith or color or gender or sexual orientation. And you'll know me, perhaps for words of a hymn, there's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. And um, as we were listening to Philip Child talk about his experiences, I think I was reminded of that saying, which many of you all know, that if you make friends with people of other faiths, you make enemies in your own. And I think that's experience some of us have, have had. And I suppose a decisive moment for me was as a student in India, I helped at a leprosy clinic. And I remember going there one day with a fellow student who was a Muslim from Andhra Pradesh, from a Catholic student who was from Sri Lanka. Uh, the doctor was a devout Vaishnavite. And it was that image, I suppose, of people of uh, different faiths being there to try and help the poor, though we learned so much from them. But really, that is what, for me, interfaith is about. And the coming, but there's been so much, and we still have to do it, for religions really to learn to trust each other, to work together for a better world. But the, the practical agenda is really important. But that vision, that practical agenda, I believe needs to be nourished by our vision of the universal compassion of the Holy One. And I suppose one of my concerns today as interfaith becomes more widely recognized is it can become a form perhaps of good community relations with a sort of religious overtone. But the real inspiration comes from that vision of oneness. And that's what I think our various interfaith organizations uh, need to witness to. And this was the vision of two pioneers of the interfaith movement who were both born 150 years ago. One on the right, your wrong husband, who was the founder of the World Congress of Faiths. Imagine now that you're in the Himalayas, somewhere in the 1890s. You're with a small group of British soldiers who are exploring the Himalayan passes. And they're sitting around the campfire in the evening, and somebody asks, who is the person you admire most? It'll be interesting later on to know what your answers are. 
Um, Wellington, somebody said Francis Drake, perhaps Nelson. And then there was a young officer who said the person he most admired was Sri Ramakrishna. Well, I don't know how many of the other officers had heard of him, and some of you perhaps may not have done. But the young officer was Francis' young husband. But I want to say something first, a, a little bit about Swami Vivekananda. So who was Sri Ramakrishna? He was a priest at a uh, Hindu temple near Calcutta, and he had this longing for a vision of God, of a vision of a god Kali, where he was a priest at the temple. And eventually he had that vision. But what then he did was pursue other spiritual paths and, in, and having a vision of Rama and other of the Hindu tradition. But then somebody gave him a Bible and he read the Bible and pursued the Christian path. And he had this vision of Jesus. And who sang in the depths of Sri Ramakrishna's soul, I read from a book, Behold the Christ who shed his heart's blood for the redemption of the world. It is he, the master yogi, who is in eternal union with God. It is Jesus' love incarnate. And out of that experience, Sri Ramakrishna became convinced that what the spiritual vision that unites us, we can follow different paths, but there is an underlying spiritual vision of unity with all people. That was Sri Ramakrishna. Now his disciple, Swami Vivekananda, was one of the key characters of the 1893 Chicago Parliament of World Religions. And he was very much a public attention wearing his gorgeous robes. And when he began, he began sisters and brothers of America. It was a peal of applause, I said, uh, which lasted several minutes. And then he went on, I'm proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. He quoted Lord Krishna's words, whoever comes to me through whatever path I reach him, they are all struggling through paths that in the end always lead to me. And so it is that underlying, that vision of a spiritual unity which transcends our particular paths which we follow. There are the orange robes. But Vivekananda also made clear that vision and service go together, and that's really what I hope we'll be doing today, renewing our vision and deepening our commitment to service. Because before he set out for America, he went to the rock, at Kanya Kumari, at the extreme tip of southern India. And there he uh, made this commitment. He dedicated his life, he said, to my God, the wicked, my God, the afflicted, my God, the poor of all races. And that duality, the universal compassion, and that commitment. Now, as I said, young husband regarded Vivekananda as one of his heroes. He also, this is the 1880s, 1890s, writing about um, the Bab, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, and the whole Baha'i tradition he was influenced by. He was influenced also very much by Tolstoy. And I find it's interesting, so much of this was going on really in the late 19th century, because sometimes people talk about the movement as, as very new. But more important for young husband than the various books he read was a, a visit to the Hansa people. They were a small tri tribal people in the Himalayan foothills. And he had there really his first mystical experience. He describes it in his book called The Gleam. Two things, the transcendent voice of a singer and a holy man who suggested that each religion was a path up the mountain of God. 
and the film is being made about young Holden's life, and some of us have seen a trailer, and that was there. And then, in 1903, Lord Curzon asked the young husband to lead an expedition to Tibet. Concern was really to stop Russia becoming a threat through Afghanistan to the Indian Empire. So there was a whole sort of political debate about it. And there was a tragic battle as part of that tradition. But at the end, the, the young husband made a peace treaty with the Dalai Lama. But the next day, he went climbing in the Himalayas. And he had what was a decisive mystical experience, and this is what he said. Now that I grew up in me something infinitely greater than mere elation or goodwill. Elation grew to exaltation. Exaltation thrilled me through with overpowering intensity. I was beside myself and with, filled with an untellable joy. Never again could I think evil Never again could I bear enmity. Joy had begotten love. And so again we have that linking of a spiritual experience and a, a universal compassion. And appropriately, the Dalai Lama is now one of the patrons of the World Congress of Faiths. Well, to go on with Young's husband for a moment, 30 years later, he went to, to Chicago. Why did I wait so long? It wasn't perhaps so much about going to Chicago, but why had he not done anything about the interfaith vision? And the interesting thing is that in that year, 1933, there was another interfaith congress in Chicago. It was billed as the second parliament of world religions, though often forgotten. But I like this because it links, it's just as IRF is linked back, to that 1893 Parliament. So, in a way, one of the links of the World Congress go back there. And he was asked to arrange um, another Congress, which was held in London in 1936. And, of course, one of the key people was Dr. Radhakrishnan, Yusuf Ali. And it's very interesting that many scholars from world religions came, very few religious leaders came. And, indeed, there was opposition for it. But again, young husband, despite the vision, emphasised the great importance of the practical concern of faiths. And in 1943, Bishop Bell, who of course was a bishop of Chichester, the diocese, suggested in the House of, Com uh, House of Lords that when, if a United Nations was to be set up, it must have a spiritual or religious advisory body, something we're still asking for, some of us. And he raised it, and the World Congress of Faiths took up that initiative and tried to sort of get a meeting going when the first assembly was held in, in London. But in his last, really, three years of his life, young husband was deeply concerned about the spiritual basis which was necessary for peace um, and worked for the Three Faiths and the Interfaith Declaration about what the future should be. And he also suggested, yes, he said, that without that interreligious basis, the United Nations efforts would not be of much avail unless it was inspired by an irresistible spiritual impulse. And he also suggested, which I like, that if a Pope and some staunch Protestants were to go walking in the Himalayas together, they couldn't fail to be struck by a common bond. So perhaps the next um, Congress you arrange needs to be in the Himalayas and we all go walking, <laughs> to, walking together. Um, but again, it's the practical and the spiritual that go together. Now, just very quickly, just to say a little bit more about the development, uh, the death of the young husband, Second World War, and really there was a, not very much happened until again, I think, in the sort of 70s, when the emergence particularly of religions for peace and how the faiths could come together to try and reduce the threat of nuclear, nuclear war. And then in the 1980s, and very much working with Dieter German, several of us managed to come bring the different interfaith bodies together, and that cooperation has increased and is so valuable. 
to mark the centenary of the 1893 Parliament. Now, I know there was a very big gathering in Chicago, but we also held a rather special gathering in India called Sarva Dharma Samelana. And Father Albert, of course, was one of those who helped us, Religions for Peace, the Temple of Understanding, the World Congress of Faiths, and IRF. And the game was very much looking at how we could use our interfaith commitment to make for a, a better world. There was also, at that time, the uh, gathering in Chicago, and that produced, as some of you will know, the global ethic. And this was a commitment made by many of the religious leaders there. But again, what I'm trying to suggest is the vision and the practical commitment. The Declaration invites each of us to make four commitments. To a culture of non-violence and respect for life, to a culture of solidarity and just economic order, to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness, to a culture of equal rights um, and partnership between men and women. And you could add to that. And since then, there's been um, growing cooperation the attempt to, well, the setting up an international interfaith centre in Oxford and there are new plans. Parliaments of world religions in Cape Town, Barcelona, Melbourne. There's the emergence of the electronic interfaith observer, United Religions. All sorts of things are happening. Um, and perhaps very significantly now is the backing of many of, un of United Nations. For years, um, they couldn't do anything. And when we had the year of interreligious understanding in 19, 1993, I remember going with Homer Jack and others to see the, well, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, he had had to leave, but his assistant was there and said, yes, we give you absolute support, but we can't say anything <laughs> because of a sort of communist bloc. And so things have now been transformed, the Dialogue of Civilization, the Interfaith Friendship Week. And so much, of course, this is the faiths coming together to help after disaster. But it seems to me the two need to go together, our vision and our compassion. And I suppose perhaps one of the things, as I've really hinted, is that from our interfaith organizations, we can help to renew in people the vision which will inspire that compassion. Because I think without the vision, there can become a sort of weariness in sort of compassion. And perhaps the vision will restore hope, the hope that change is possible. And these are words from a hymn we'll sing on Thursday morning, written by Fred Kahn, um, it's a hymn which has only been sung once, but uh, we met his widow recently and she's given permission for it. Let all the world united be, but how? Go out, love people in the here and now. And I just want to end, because I think it is encouraging to us, to read from the Bible that Sir Francis' young husband actually took to Tibet and it's got his dedication in it. And he's underlined at the front one verse from Isaiah. Who is among you that feareth the Lord, but obeyeth the voice of his servant, but walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. And we need to be, I think, renewed in that commitment, that vision, because that will then inspire us to serve others, and I hope, encourage others to share our hope. Thank you very much.